Did you know in the 1960s, some girl d a dolphin because she thought it would help in her quest to teach English? Don't worry, it was all in the name of science. <laughs> Animals are wild in more ways than one. We've all seen videos of smart crows, smart pigs, smart raccoons. Yeah, that's what I get for using Watch Mojo to make a point. But if animals are so smart, why can't they talk? Well, it turns out they might. A lot of people, a lot smarter than me, have been trying to talk to animals for a while now. And I'm falling headfirst down the animal communication experimentation rabbit hole. So I'm taking you with me. We've talked to animals for pretty much the whole time humans have been around. And for the last few thousand years, we've even kept some of them in our societies as companions. But we don't really hold full-on two-way conversations with cats and dogs. We just convey basic wants and needs back and forth and hope for the best. So before I go any further, I'd like to take a second and talk about what talking really is. Obviously, talking is making noises or signals that hold some meaning in order to have a conversation. But there's a big difference between this Sit, boy. and this. Speak. Hi there. <gasps> and I think that difference is language. Language is defined by Webster as the words, their pronunciation, and the methods of combining them used and understood by a community. And I'm really gonna focus in on that combining part because I think it's through the combination of words that we actually give them meaning and create conversation. For instance, let's look at the words water and fish. I could combine these two words with a ton of prepositions to communicate vastly different things. Fish in water fish on water, water on fish, water for fish, water in fish, water under, you get the idea. Just to be clear, this is an extremely simplified explanation of what language is. I mean, people spend their whole careers figuring this stuff out and then arguing about it. I just wanted to give a basic framework so that when we look at some of these experiments, we can kind of have that in the back of our heads. So let's get into it. For most of our animal escapades, scientists really wanted to talk to apes. I mean, they kinda look like us, they kinda act like us. <laughs> Overall, they kinda just give off that weird distant cousin vibe. So I guess it tracks that they might be able to learn and use language. At least, I think that's the logic behind it. So let's wind the clock back to the 1940s and take a look at Vicky the Chimp. While there had been experiments to make apes act like humans before, like that time a couple raised a chimp as a sister to their own son, Vicky really was the first time that we made any headway specifically in the language department. Keith and Catherine Hayes had a dream of teaching English to a chimpanzee. So they decided to dress Vicky like a human, treat Vicky like a human, and teach Vicky English like a human. After three long years of work, the chimp did manage to learn how to say four whole words. But based on this footage, I would use the word say very lightly. Honestly, this experiment is really most valuable because it made scientists realize that an animal who makes these noises probably doesn't have a voice box optimized for making people noises. So after Vicky did nothing else and then died at age seven due to viral meningitis, it was time for scientists to find and ruin the life of a new chimp. Next up, we have Washoe, a chimpanzee born in West Africa in 1965. Professor R. Allen Gardner did the old tried and true, take an ape from its family in the wild, put it in a house, pretend like it's a human, and hope it learns how to speak, but this time he used sign language. This was actually a pretty big success with Washoe learning hundreds of signs and being able to relate them to specific objects. It was even claimed that she could combine new signs into phrases not previously taught to her. <gasps> What's that? Oh yeah. That's the language alarm, because that sounds an awful lot like the basics of language. But all good things must come to an end. And as Washoe's progress slowed, researchers grew bored with her. And by the end of the 1960s, she was sent to a Chimp Behavioral Research Institute. Luckily, we'd finally figured out how to keep chimps from dying on us. So Washoe was actually able to live out a full life, eventually somewhat coming to terms with her chimera-like existence. Not a human, but not fully chimp anymore either. The success of Washoe served to inspire a whole new wave of ape language research, and the next victim was Nim. At first, Nim was also raised like a human by one of the researchers and her family in New York City, 
But once Nim turned two and wrecked the house one too many times, the lead researcher, Herbert Terrace, rehomed Nim to the much more healthy environment of Columbia University. Terrace was skeptical of the Washoe claims and wanted to run extensive tests of his own. He was also a lot more scientific in his methods than the Washoe team or any of these other ape language project teams for that matter. So the Nim experiments began and Nim, just like Washoe, quickly learned hundreds of signs. But that wasn't really good enough for Terrace as while Nim had gained a large vocabulary, he hadn't really started using language. For example, Nim's longest sentence was a request for an orange, and here is how he so eloquently put it. Give orange me, give eat orange, me eat orange, give me eat orange, give me you. This does demonstrate that Nim could communicate when he wanted something, but it's not really using language. It's more like he's trying to brute force a problem, saying the words he knows he's supposed to say in a random order until he gets what he wants. This was the conclusion Terrace came to as well. Nim wasn't building sentences with structure. As demonstrated by his orange request, he had no idea how to actually arrange the words, and he couldn't figure out how to add more words to further explain his request. So, with all the data from the Washoe experiments thoroughly called into question, Terrace ended the Nim experiments in 1977, and Nim, a chimpanzee who now fully believed that he was a human, was separated from his family and sent to live with other chimpanzees in a cage at another research institute. Just as a reminder, scientists took a chimp from its family in the wild, gave it a whole new human family, taught it it was a human, tried to get it to talk like a human, and when they were done with it, they threw it away. But at the same time Terrace was trying to disprove the Washoe claims, Penny Patterson was actually inspired to adopt a gorilla and begin a lifelong experiment of her own. Coco the gorilla is the most famous of all of these talking apes, and according to some, the best evidence to date for a talking animal. In 1972, Patterson began to work with her after being inspired by Washoe, and she found even more exciting results. Look, I'ma be honest, I don't think Coco could talk any more than the rest of these apes and I don't need to look any further than her final message to the world before her death in 2018. I didn't edit that. This clip is so cut together that it's impossible to tell what, if any, message was even being communicated to begin with. And that's before addressing whether or not an ape could comprehend such abstract concepts as the earth or climate change. And that's before addressing the fact that the vast majority of her communication was filtered and translated directly through Patterson, who was clearly biased when it came to Coco's speech. While the other researchers I've mentioned so far could and probably should be called cruel for the apathy they showed toward the animals they were studying, Penny is the exact opposite. She viewed and treated Coco like her own child, and it's pretty clear to me that she coaxed, projected, and interpreted signs made by a gorilla that wasn't 100% sure what was going on and was usually trying to get rewarded. Basically, Coco was doing the same thing as Nim and his old weird orange request thing, but the difference was she was communicating with someone who really wanted her to be talking. Don't get me wrong, I do believe Patterson and Coco had a deep bond and shared a connection. I just don't believe that connection came from them communicating with sign language. But now let's switch gears, cause I'm sick of trying to talk to apes and I kinda wanna know what other animals might have some thoughts that they may wanna share with us. This album, Songs of the Humpback Whale, was released in 1970, and it was the first time most people ever heard the vocalizations of our cetacean friends. This recording was done by Roger Payne after he realized the sounds made by humpbacks were more than just random clicks and whistles. As he listened, Payne heard distinct songs, memorized and sung by males during mating season, sometimes solo, sometimes in chorus. He documented complex melodies, song structures, and repetition not so different from human songs. This album would become a surprise hit, selling 125,000 copies and serving to galvanize conservationist movements to protect these creatures. This album is in part responsible for the eventual international ban on whaling in 1986, 
and the further protective measures that have brought many species back from the brink of extinction. The public perception of whales was forever changed in 1970. They were now seen as intelligent animals, and our imaginations were sparked as to what meaning might lie within their songs. But a neuroscientist named John C. Lilly was ahead of the curve, and he was already trying to figure out what was on their mind. Lilly actually began researching dolphins all the way back in the 1950s, and on top of the clearly complex communication between members of a pod, Lilly also noticed the dolphins in captivity, mimicking the cadence and rhythm of human speech. This, of course, led him to the scientific conclusion that they were trying to speak with us, so we should teach them English. So he wrote a book about it, drummed up some interest, and specifically framed things as though learning to communicate with dolphins could help us learn to communicate with aliens. Now that's not actually as crazy as it sounds, because if dolphins do communicate in their own language, it could be classified as alien. This was good enough for NASA, who threw some money at him to build a half-flooded laboratory in the Caribbean for dolphin-human speech studies in 1963. Then in 64, a young woman named Margaret Lovett showed up at the facility and asked to help in any way she could. Long story short, she and Lily devised an experiment where she would live full-time with one of the dolphins to teach it English. Basically, they flooded a new room with several feet of seawater, suspended a bed and desk above the water, and moved Margaret and Peter in to live together for six days at a time over a 10-week period. On the seventh day of each week, Peter would be moved in with the other two female dolphins for bonding time. As the experiment commenced, Lovett and Lily grew increasingly excited by Peter's progress, even though it was all basically just this. A E I O. As I mentioned earlier, the alien angle was the big reason that Lily was able to do this kind of research, and he actually became friends with several big shot astronomers at the time. Carl Sagan actually visited the St. Thomas Laboratory on several occasions, and at one point actually suggested a hilariously simple and actually scientific experiment just to confirm whether dolphins did actually have language. But Lily preferred the whole try to make dolphins speak English angle, so that's what they went with. I also want to point out that Lily had first thought about learning Dolphinese, but determined it impossible for humans to speak. So he imposed the opposite standard on dolphins, trying to teach them English. In fact, it was even worse because dolphins don't actually communicate with each other through air in the wild. Dolphin communication is obviously optimized for aquatic use. They can push sound through their blowholes above water, but still, none of their vocal anatomy is remotely comparable with humans. As you could probably figure out just by listening to a dolphin whistle, they can't really replicate consonants at all. You know, those letters that make up the majority of the English alphabet? At this point, while I'm kind of calling Lily's methods into question, I'm also going to bring up the other angle that a lot of his research took, mainly being drug fuel. That book he wrote that I mentioned earlier? He admitted to colleagues that he wrote it while high on amphetamines over the course of a weekend. While Lovett was chilling with Peter in that live-in experiment, he was in a secluded upstairs office, floating in a sensory deprivation tank, hallucinating on ketamine. He claimed he was convening with the Earth Coincidence Control Office, an alien council that was guiding him toward breakthroughs in interspecies communication. While on that topic, the sensory deprivation tank was actually the invention of John C. Lilly, which he used mainly for psychoactive and psychedelic trips, but that's a fun piece of trivia. Meanwhile, as the experiment went on, Peter grew more and more restless. He was a young, strapping dolphin after all, basically going through puberty, and he was having more and more urges. So eventually, Lovett decided that in order to interrupt their English lessons as little as possible, she would relieve his urges with her hand. Margaret has always said that she never looked at this action as sexual, but she also says that it did build their bond, and I highly doubt Peter saw this as simply platonic. This has become the lasting legacy of the Lily Dolphin experiments. A girl jacking off a dolphin. Hustler magazine famously turned this into a salacious article about a decade later, playing up the sexual nature of the experiment to honestly a, a disgusting extent. You can always count on class from 20th century porno mags. Back to the 60s though, even after the living experiment was complete, the research continued. But the lack of any real cross-species communication, along with the lack of any new funding, 
was not a good sign for the project. At this point, there's a strong argument Lily was a full-on drug addict and it was heavily affecting his work. At some point, he got really into LSD and of course, he decided to give it to Peter the Dolphin. Now, I have no idea what the actual intention was behind this experiment, but it failed. By this point, and in part because of this experiment, a lot of Lily's staff had lost faith in him. And that, combined with, you know, running out of money, caused the lab to close in 1966. All three dolphins were moved to a small lab in Miami with tanks barely large enough for them to swim in. And after a few days there, Peter stopped breathing on purpose. Dolphins actually make an active choice to breathe. It's not passive like in humans. So a dolphin can actually choose to quit the game by just deciding not to breathe. It's very possible that the juxtaposition between Peter's life at the St. Thomas Laboratory and his incredibly depressing existence in Miami is what ultimately led to his death. But because of his relationship with Margaret, it's much more popular and grossly romantic, I guess, to claim that he died of a broken heart. I mean, while Margaret may have seen their interactions as clinical, I don't think there's any way on earth Peter could have understood that. Horrifyingly enough, there is evidence of dolphin-human relationships out there, and I'm not gonna go into it, but it does seem very much within the realm of possibility for a dolphin to catch feelings for a human. Ultimately though, this whole project just boils down to treating an animal like a human, trying to make it act like a human, and then throwing it away when you're done with it. Now, let's skip forward to modern day. Animal speech research has really lost the widespread public appeal that it once had, but it's still kind of going on. I'm going to switch gears for a moment, though, and dip my toes into the pop culture animal talking space, specifically on TikTok. Bunny the dog is a Shiba Doodle on TikTok who appears to display animal-human communication via the use of language with her owner, Alexis Devine. The key word here is appears because there's no scientific evidence whatsoever that this is happening. Alexis adopted Bunny as a puppy and began an experiment that would later gain them both viral fame. She placed a button next to her door and encouraged Bunny to press it anytime she wanted to go for a walk. This has expanded into a large modular board with over a hundred buttons, all of which audibly speak an English word when pressed. Bunny presses these buttons to string together sentences, which Alexis then interprets and communicates back. So far, I haven't seen Bunny respond using the buttons to any communication from Alexis. This probably all sounds a little familiar because it's basically what was happening with the apes. Specifically, this whole thing gives some serious Coco vibes. Importantly, all the evidence Alexis shows are short clips, and often within these clips, Bunny appears to me to be pressing buttons looking for reward. Alexis disagrees with this potential explanation and instead posts videos with captions like, Bunny the talking dog has existential thoughts. Who is it? Notice the constant cuts and Alexis clearly interpreting meaning from Bunny's button presses. Alexis will claim that there are plans to use Bunny in scientific experiments or something, but the reality is you could have a really simple experiment of your own by just firing up a live stream and having a conversation with Bunny. I mean, she's been doing this since 2019 and has had amazing results on TikTok. So it should be pretty simple to have a basic back and forth with Bunny without incessant jump cuts. Notably, there are several live streams from the pair, and at first I thought this would be a great example for Alexis to communicate with Bunny and Bunny to answer back, but Bunny never makes any attempts to communicate with the buttons at all. Dogs are really intelligent, and Bunny is a really intelligent dog. I think it's awesome that you can train your dog to communicate using buttons but you don't have to dress it up like Bunny is some kind of super dog that has a firm grasp on the English language, human level self-awareness, and existential musings. That existential clip of Bunny that I showed earlier, I also chose that for a particular reason. The crux of that video involves Bunny recognizing herself in a mirror. Unfortunately, real scientists who do real experiments have come to the conclusion that 
Dogs, and most animals, don't have the self-awareness to understand how mirrors work. If Bunny can actually recognize her own reflection... <laughs> so you can see yourself. She can potentially change a lot of what we know about canine intelligence. Or this video could be fake. I don't think Alexis Divine is some kind of liar or con woman. I think she's probably just like Penny Patterson with Coco. In other words, she's emotionally invested and unable to genuinely think critically about the situation. Well, now she is profiting off this whole racket, selling button kits so people at home can teach their dogs to talk, and now she also has a book, so she actually does have good reason to be dishonest about Bunny. That also brings up the question of how much Coco the gorilla was worth when she died, but uh... We'll just give everyone the benefit of the doubt. Anyway, that's all that's exciting happening in the world of talking to animals these days, other than uh, pet psychics and AI projects that'll probably be dead in five years. Honestly, researching this video has taught me that people have a weird obsession with testing animals by human standards. Like, why do we feel like we have to talk to animals? Why can't we just let them be animals? They're, they're really cool on their own, whether or not they can talk. It's possible, and I really hope we do one day decode the complex vocalizations of whales. But even if we find out that they're not talking the way that we do, I hope we remember that they don't need to. Like I said at the beginning of this video, animals are wild, and that should be enough. So if you liked the video, feel free to leave it a like. And if you disliked it, dislike it. And let me know all the ways I'm wrong in the comments below. If you want to see another video about a niche topic no one cares about, check out my video about the Dungeons & Dragons Satanic Panic. Or hit subscribe to stay up to date on whatever I want to talk about next. Bye!